Praise the Lord. God is good tonight. We thank the Lord for his mercy and his love. And I pray that tonight will be a blessing. We welcome those of you that are coming on right now in the internet, that uh, you will be blessed tonight with tonight's Bible study as we gather together to just uh, pray for this nation, uh, pray for what's going on in Texas right now with the, the mass shooting that took place there in Ubaldi, and we just pray for the parents, the family members, and all that were involved in that, that uh, what a crisis, needless, if we would be able to secure those schools across America and protect them little ones. It's amazing, but we pray for all the family members, those that were lost, for the tragedy that has taken place there. America is going through a lot of things and I don't think people really understand, especially people that are not involved in the news that much, don't realize the things that are going on, the problems that are existing, um, the crisis around the world. Take New Mexico, for example, the fires that have been devastating, the fires here, uh, the flooding, the hunger that's going on, the battles, Ukraine and Africa, and all the things that we're seeing everywhere. There's just unrest. Everywhere you go, there's something that's going on. And it's to me, it's a sign of the times that the Lord is just letting us know that time is running out. Things are happening, and we're going to see more empty shelves. We're going to see more gas prices going up. We're going to see problems with the water. They're going to have to regulate the water because you look at the places that we get our water here in California, Lake Mead is down to nothing. It's, it's really, really bad. I was looking at a, a newscast about that yesterday, and I mean, it's down, 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 down. Uh, there was things that when they built it, there was a town and there was this, there was that. All that's exposed now because the water levels have gone so far down that everything is being exposed again. And water levels that we have up north, also we're going to have uh, problems with electricity. Watch and see in the summertime when everybody turns on their air conditioners, you're going to have blackouts. They have them in San Francisco now. It's coming here. There's a lot of things that are going on that we don't realize, that we don't understand, and that's why it's so important that we understand the, the Bible, the last days as we're studying on the breakdown and going back and looking at all the things that the Lord is telling us. This is scriptural. It's biblical. It's not something that someone has made up. It's the things that we see, the things that we understand, how the Lord has admonished us, and the things that are happening, the things that are going to continue and that's why it's important that we prepare ourselves, our, our families, our loved ones that are going through all these things as well, our young people, look at the schools, look at the things that are going on right now, the border, all the things that are happening, the sickness, the disease, that monkeypox that's coming in. I mean, these are things that people don't even understand that are coming on. And uh, it is important that we understand that Jesus told us and warned us of the plagues that were going to come. The last days, Matthew 24 says that plagues would come and things were going to happen. So I pray tonight that we can understand and realize the things that we're facing, the things that are coming this way, and they're just going to escalate and get worse and worse. We are a nation that has turned our back on God for the better part. We look at uh, the politicians that didn't want God in school, didn't want the Bible, and we look at the things that we've, we're facing right now. They're real. They're, they're happening right before our very eyes, and yet people don't realize it at all. But that's what they wanted, and now we see the residual effects of rejecting God. It is something real. We've never seen so much crime and what these crazy politicians are doing by getting rid of the, the police, not 
putting these men and in, in keeping them in jail, incarcerated. They let them go out. As soon as they commit a crime, you're back out in the street. It makes no sense. Common sense is thrown out. You have the Looney Tunes now running the institution of government, and that is the problem. You have people that are not fit to run the government that are running the government, and yet we keep voting. People keep voting for them and expecting new results. That is ludicrous. That is insane. And so that's a part of what we're going through. So I pray tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit that God would touch, bless, restore this nation, that we would turn around and come back to the Lord. Again, we lift up all those people there in Ubaldi, Lord God, that are suffering, that are going through this crazy crisis that has happened there, Lord, all the shootings and the murders, Father God, that took place. We pray for the wars, Lord God, as well, in Ukraine and around the world, in Africa, the things that are happening there in South America, Latin America, Father God, in Mexico. We pray, Father God, for all these countries that are just suffering right now and for the nations of the world, Lord God. And we pray for America, America, to come back to you, Father God. It is drunk with power, and it's gone insane, Lord God. And we have those, Father God, that the inmates are, are running the institution, Lord God. And we just pray that you would intervene and help us, Father, at this time. And so we pray, Father, for all the needs, all the people. We lift up those in our church, Lord God, that are going through a crisis for your homes, your families, your loved ones. And I pray for them as well, for healing and blessings, Lord God, that only you can do, Father. And so we pray for everyone that is going through a time that is very difficult right now. For those that are sick, Father God, I pray for Blanca's sister. I pray, Father God, that you would bless her and heal her in the name of Jesus. I pray for Betty, Father God, and, and Willie, Lord, and I pray for those that are just going through a, a hard time right now, Father God. I pray for Brother Jack, Lord God, uh, and I pray, Father, for all the people that are just going through just something that is very difficult. And so we pray for Al. Bless us, Father God, tonight as we submerge ourselves in your word. And Lord, help us to be like the Bereans, Father, just like the Bereans of just absorbing your word and asking for your blessing, Father God. And we ask it in Jesus' name, Father. We, again, we pray for the peace, the peace, the peace of Jerusalem. And we pray for America, Father God. Bless us, Father God, that America would come back. We love you and praise you, my God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And we say amen. And for those of you that are joining us, Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we've been dealing with one of the longest chapters on married, celibacy, and just different topics that Paul the Apostle had given us so that we can understand <clears throat> where we stand in the things that we're facing, the things that are going on. And he, in chapter 7, we deal, as we started, in verse 18 of chapter 7, where he gives us different illustrations and metaphors of where we are at, the things that were going on at that time. As the church was being built, as the church was starting to grow, and seeing the problems that were existing as they came to Paul, the ministers that he installed in these different churches that would would call him and say, is this permissible? What do we do about this situation? And what do we do about that situation? And because they didn't have the New Testament at that time, Paul begins to write these letters and says, now circulate them amongst yourselves to give you a guide of what to expect and the things to do. So Paul gave us 13 epistles of the New Testament in helping us to understand the direction, the insight, and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and of God in ministering to us so that we would be able to have a way of looking back and understanding the situations and the problems that would exist. And so Corinth, the book of Corinthians had, had been a way of, of letting us know how to deal with all these different issues from the beginning of time of lawsuits and 
suing one another and marriage and divorce and so many things that, that he was talking to us. But here, they were having problems that one of the young men was sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother. He was sleeping with her, and he says, that can't happen. He says, and you still have him in there like everything is okay. He should be excommunicated for a while and a time so that the Lord would deal with him. So now he begins to share with us because many of the Judaizers and the Gnostics were telling them, well, now you got to keep these laws and you got to do this and you got to do that in order for us to receive you into Christianity as Jews because now, again, we were being brought into the vine, into, into Judaism because of the fact that we were being grafted into the vine. And I love the way Paul the Apostle shares with us in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. And we see the past, the present, and the future of the Gentile and the Jew. It is very important that we study those one day, the past, the present, and the future of knowing what what the Lord is admonishing us, what the Lord is saying to us as we begin to grow and understand the calling of God, how God desires for us to be able to understand your heritage, your, your roots of who you are in Christ. Uh, because a lot of times what we try to do, and this is why I feel that Paul began to write and share with the, the Corinthians the way he did and uh, tell her, what chapter we're on, Nick, uh, and what, what we begin to see as how he gives us a guideline of, of sharing with us how to understand the issues and breaking it down so we can be able to absorb and understand the things that were coming up, the things that were happening. Again, it was very fresh, very new in building the church. So these topics begin to happen, and again, for us, as Gentiles coming out of the world, being very legalistic, very pagan, very mystical in our beliefs. And even today, you go to Latin America, South America, Mexico, it's very mystical in the things that they do. Very superstitious in many ways of certain things that we do and the customs and, and traditions. And so, Dealing with this, we begin to see a lot of the things that were, that were surfacing at that time that Paul was trying to deal with, with the different issues, because you had those other people that were coming in and undermining everything that Paul was saying as the Judaizers were, and the Gnostics were coming in that had a different philosophy, a different doctrine. And they said, yes, we believe in you Gentiles coming in, but you got to do this, you got to do that. And what they were doing is putting the people right back into bondage. And no one wanted to be under that bondage. And so when you go back and you look at Galatians, again, Paul begins to share in the book of Galatians works, and you, and you begin to see grace. And nowhere do you see that we are to do this, do that, in order to obtain salvation or, or understand the, the blessings of God. God's grace is sufficient for all of us as long as we abide. And these are the things that the Lord was saying, abide in me and I in you and I will help you and strengthen you. So in looking at all the things that were going on, Paul trying to explain to the people <clears throat> not to get weary because of the problems that were existing in the church within itself because of the fact of people trying to convert people. And there's always people that are legalistic that are trying to put bondage on people. Your hair's too long. Your dress is, is too short. All these things were coming out in a different manner. Now, you had the homosexuals that were coming in, the men, and they had long, long hair. And Paul says, you can come in if you want to hear the word of God, but don't come in soliciting. Cut your hair. And the women in those days were ball-headed, the prostitutes. And they would come in, he says, hey, you could come in and hear the word of God, but put something over your head. 
so that you're not in here soliciting for any business. You're here to hear the word of God. Well, out of, out of that, there was tradition that were made that a woman could not enter the temple unless her head was covered. And, and just, again, legalistic in all the things that were going on. And that was not what he was saying. And in those days, to begin with, the woman's hair was her power and her glory. And the customs of that day was to cover her head and to be covered at all times that no one should be able to see your wife's hair but you. You would be the only one that would be able to see her unveil herself and let her hair down. And that was her glory. That was her power. That was her anointing that she would let her hair down before her husband. If she would walk out in the street uncovered, she was looked upon as a wife that was rebellious and not wanting to maintain the custom and the tradition, being very unfaithful to her husband. So these were the things that were going on at that time. So here now, as Paul is writing back and explaining back to the pastors and those <clears throat> that had asked for a uh, some type of guidance, some type of leadership, some type of answer for the things that were existing at that time. What do we do? Again, for Jews, one of the biggest things that they really pushed was circumcision, especially for the men, to be circumcised. That was a seal, but that did not pertain to us not as Gentiles. That was not a bondage that was presented to us. And Paul told us that. So here in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians 19, he says, circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. Either way, keeping God's commandment is what counts. Understanding the law of God, the blessings of God, the nature of God, the posture of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit within our lives, how to really understand and submit to the Holy Spirit and the blessings of the Spirit of God within our life. And that's why we acknowledge and we begin to understand what the Lord is saying to us. But as far as the essence of Christianity was concerned, what really was what mattered more than anything was keeping the commandments of God. The commandments of God of realizing the doctrines that the Lord God had given us. Not those false religions that would add and take away and exchange the things that God had already commanded us. But to look at the commandments of God, what God gave us and how we viewed it and how we understood it. In other words, Paul was concerned with what was inward as God is. At the spirit of the living God. Not what was outward, but what was inward within ourselves. And how we projected and how we ministered and how our testimony in speaking to people, our manner of life, our manner of character, our manner of the way we live would make all the difference in the world. And how we view the things, not the inner things, but the things that gave that testimony of who God is. While observing the eternal forms that God had given us and how to understand. And so those things that most of the Judaizers and the Gnostics were, were impressing on the people, were refuting a lot of what Paul had given us. Even Paul says in the book of Galatians, as they kept undermining him and undermining him, he says, now you look at me, do I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now that you're looking at me, am I becoming your enemy because I'm telling you the truth and not putting you into bondage like these other people want to put you into bondage. I'm sharing with you to help you. And that's why he says, if any man, in Galatians chapter 1, 
He says, if any man or any being or anyone come preaching to you another gospel, then that which I have preached to you, let him be an athema. The word athema means let him go to the lowest part of the earth. In other words, if you break it down, let him go to the lowest part of hell. He said, don't believe any of that. Separate yourself from that. If any man or any being, any, anyone that comes and says, change this or change that or do this or do that, let him be anathema. Let him go and curse him because that's not what God intended. But observing the law of God, that was the important thing. But a lot of the people at that time, when they came in, they didn't like the freedom they didn't like the grace, and they didn't understand grace. And they wrestled with that. No, 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 no. Uh, that's fine what you're saying, but okay, okay, I'll accept the grace. But I'm going to add what I want. Well, then it's no longer grace. Don't try to barter with God. Well, I'll do this if you do that for me, Lord. God doesn't barter with anyone. And so with them trying to do what they felt was right, and it, trying to accept the gospel, but adding to it, adding to watering down and diluting the word of God of grace that they didn't know how to deal with. They were so used to custom traditions, formalities, and practices that you must do it this way. You must continue doing these things. Crawl up the hill, beat yourself fast, and tell the people, Look at me, I'm fasting for the Lord. That was all fake. But these are the things that, that they really paraded themselves and wanted everyone to see how they were. But the Lord God is, is gentle and meek and kind, and the Spirit of the living God is, is awesome to give us the strength and, and the understanding and the fortitude to, to move forward. He empowers us as, as we come and observing the importance of, of the blessings of God. And Paul was getting a, kind of upset because of the Judaizers just bringing bondage into the people that were coming in to the gospel and trying to undermine in those areas. So his concern was keep the requirements of God. As long as you keep the requirements of God, again, when you look at doctrine and the requirements, and people would say throughout the centuries, people have come and gone, and people have created so many different doctrines. And it's because someone says, I've got a better idea. I believe it's this way. And he puts in his two cents, and then he puts in his two cents, and he puts in his two cents, and pretty soon we have all these that are called now denominations. And the denominations are made by man. They're not made of God. God didn't come and say, okay, I want the Baptists, the Catholics, the Methodists, the Episcopalian, the Assemblies of God. I want all these denominations. God never said that. We were all under the theocracy of God and the blessings of God. But man, in his way of reaching out, we had all these de different denominations that have come, even to this day, from going back into Judaism. There's how many denominations just alone in Judaism, and they all are Jews. And they all believe in one way of circumcision and all these things, but there's so many different denominations because someone had a better idea. Just like in the Baptist church and the, and, and, and the Methodists and the Catholics, you got the Coptics, the Greek Orthodox, and, you, and the Pentecostals. I mean, you got tons of different denominations in the Pentecostals, but they all profess to be the holiness and all these other things that the Jesus only, and we're all Pentecostals. So, all those were made by men, men that initiated these things, that put these denominations together 
and, and they became doctrine for so many. Paul says, keep what I've given you. The Lord never again, when he came on earth, now, I want the Methodist church, I want the Episcopalian church, I want the Baptist church, I want, and I want, and I want. Most people, when they say, well, we're Baptists or we're Southern Baptists, when you go back and you look, and they took that from John the Baptist, that if you go back in time and you look, John the Baptist never, never, never baptized one Gentile. Not one. His calling was to baptize Jews into repentance. Into repentance. Not for them to be born again, but for them to repent. And so when they say, well, we're this, they took on a name that really he never baptized one of them, not even the forefathers of, of the Gentile world. John the Baptist had nothing to do with them. So it's by faith that we as believers begin to see the things that are different, and we begin to rise up to the position where the Lord is looking for us to move and to understand and to, to see the glory of the Lord, the posture and the blessing, and fall in love with Jesus. And so what the Lord had said, keep the commandments. Again, when you look at the commandments, did Jesus teach it? It's number one. Did the Lord teach us circumcision? No. Did the Lord teach us all these other things? No. Did the apostles practice it when they came on the scene? Is it found in the book of Acts? No. Then it's not doctrine. Then it's not something that the Lord had given us and admonished us and said, do it this way. It's not doctrine. The apostle didn't practice it, and it's not found in the book of Acts. So you can't say that that's doctrine when a lot of these people were putting this bondage on the Gentiles and all the other people. That you got to do this and look at that and, and change this and change that. So he says, no, circumcision doesn't go for each one. Verse 20 should remain in the situation which... Notice what she was in when God called him. I know that God called me. I can't change the fact of what the Lord had done. If a person was, you know, engaged in some kind of business, was it crooked? Then get out of it. But if it was legit, well, stay in it since you've been converted. But you didn't take it on if you knew it was crooked. You were expected to leave. You were expected to, to change, to see the things that would be different for us in growing and being blessed and understanding the glory of God. Notice verse 21. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can't gain your freedom, just do what God is calling you to do. Maintain. Maintain. And it'll be a time. You will get your freedom. God is going to deliver you. So that knowing that the illustration of coming together as being a slave, yet finding the will of God. If a believer was a servant of the Lord or a slave when he was converted, he should not react in a different situation. But be able to look at that and say, give it time and see what God is going to do with this situation. A lot of us, when we come to the Lord and we truly believe in walking with Jesus, you look at your life from where you started and how your life changes through the years in a different way. And you begin to see the blessings that are added to you. So that you don't lose anything, but God gives you so much more. When you look back, you would say, I could never ever imagine in my life that I would be able to be blessed and see and feel 
the blessings that God has given. And so that we would not lose our spirituality and yet have peace and victory in the Lord. Even as a slave, even as one that was in bondage, so they say, that God was going to intervene and God was going to bless me, that I would wait on the hand of God. Like what Joseph did in the house of Potiphar. Joseph, again, innocent, when his brothers sold him into slavery. He could have hemmed and howled and, and been rebellious, and I hate you, and I don't want nothing, and this is unfair, and it's unjust, and yet he was sold into slavery and was in prison in Egypt. And all the while, being faithful to the calling of God, being faithful to what God had given him, knowing that God had placed his hands on him, serving the Lord, capturing the visions, hearing the voice of God, speaking with the oracles of God to the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, telling them the things that God was going to do, and having his faith directed on God. Even when he was called to, to Pharaoh, in front of Pharaoh, he did not crumble or he did not go under and forfeit his calling to God. He said, if the Lord wills, if my God will give me the dream that I can interpret, I will interpret it to you, Pharaoh. If, if my God will do it. He didn't say, oh, my Lord, here's my chance to escape. Here's my chance to do this. Here's my ch He did not. He remained faithful. And what happened? God put him in a place where he was second to Pharaoh as a Jew, arch enemy. But now he stands and reigns. And the only one that was greater than him on earth was Pharaoh. And God pole vaulted him to that position because of his faithfulness and because of his love for God. Yes, he was in the prison. He was in bondage. He was a slave. And they sold him. And Potiphar took him home. Even to the point that Potiphar's wife lied. And she wanted Joseph very much. She wanted Potiphar was a eunuch. A eunuch was castrated. And as a eunuch, he could not be with her intimate. And so she wanted Joseph. And Joseph says, no way. I'm under the leadership of Potiphar. And she lied and put him back in prison. And the Lord took him out. At that point, Gave him that position that he had because of his faithfulness to God. Knowing that his situation, like ours, we come from the world with a lot of baggage from the world into Christianity. We have different baggages and things that we do. Lying, cheating, stealing, drugs, booze. You can go on and on. And these are the things that we bring in as we try to serve the Lord. The Lord says, hey, get rid of that. With your testimonies and all the things that you're doing. How do we react to those kind of things that is similar to the things that were going on at that time? As Paul is admonishing the people, listen. Listen. Notice verse 22. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord God is the Lord's free man. What? How can I be free if I'm still a slave? Simply trying to say to us, who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. 
a similarity that we become slaves unto the Lord. Duloid, as Paul said. I'm a duloid. I'm a bond servant. And that meant that you were not a slave of authority. Paul said, no, no, no. When you would see in Roman days and those big ships that they would have, they had two levels of those that would, with the oars, and they, would, they were the ones that make the ship move. The ones that were at the bottom, those oars were in the water all the time. And that was hard. That was the worst to be under the under roars because those guys, their oars wouldn't come out of the water. They were just in the water and forcing nothing but strength. And you had to continue. The ones that were up on top, their oars would come out of the water and then back in the water. Okay, here we go again. And, and then they would be able to rest a little bit. But those that were under the water, those were the worst. That was the worst of the worst. And Paul said, I'm a duloid. I'm an under roar. I'm a slave that's underneath the ship. And my oars never come out of the water. I'm not at the top. I don't have that freedom. I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. At the bottom. Whatever he desires, I will do. The illustration that he gives us is looking at our own lives and saying, if a man is a slave and you've been called that way at that time to view your life as you are being converted and your conversion, don't let go and don't worry. Because God has his hand upon you. Because if you love him and you are genuine with the Lord God, with your love, and how you honor the Lord, and putting your love and your commitment and your strength as an underroar in action for the glory of God. And saying, no matter what life throws at me, I'm an underroar for the Lord God. I'm moving forward. I'm not complaining. I'm not pouting. I'm going forward for the kingdom of God no matter what. That's the analogy as you look at that person that was put in that position that was difficult. It was a matter of action. A matter of moving forward. And finding the will of God. And walking in victory. Putting that into action no matter what the cost is. I will do it for the kingdom of God. So we need to keep our courtship, our calling fresh and alive in the kingdom of God. And he talks about us realizing our positions in life and the similarities that he gives us in understanding, enduring in marriages, in homes, that involves unconditional commitments at times. You look at your life and you're committed because we're imperfect people going through many crises, Learning how to grow, learning how to adapt, learning how to give, learning how to be flexible for the kingdom of God, learning how to adapt, seeing the way your life is being changed, trying to be that individual that God has called, willing to allow the Lord to mold you and shape you, that you're going to be blessed. That one day, as I look back, we were in bondage. Like that man that he says here, if you are a slave, don't worry about it. Do what 
the best that you can with your life and watch God begin to bless you in the future. We came out of the world handicapped. We were in bondage with so many things. And yet the Lord says, you were still converted because of his love. He didn't say, get rid of all that. The Lord says, I'll take you as you are. I'll take you as you are. And I will convert you. And in the process of our life, we're going through conversions day after day of the things that we're going through that we're being cleaned and expressing our love as we continue as an underroar for the Lord God. No matter what, I'm learning, I'm growing, and God is dealing with me. And I know it's hard, and sometimes I mess up, but I got to keep going forward because God called me. Hallelujah. You, you just can't bail and say, well, I don't like that. We're under oars, and we all came in with so much baggage. You can just name it. And the things that we've seen. So if we were free at the time of our conversion, we should realize how our life still needs to change. And how we were still enslaved in one manner or another. You look at people that you would say are successful, quote unquote. They are successful. They're actors. They're entertainers. They've got money. Woof. They're successful. And yet they're unhappy. All the money and all the tea in China doesn't please them. They're not successful because they, they don't keep their eyes on God. And the problems that exist in their life, they struggle to maintain. Money can't give them that. Money can't give them the blessing that only God can give them. Only the Lord can, can give them the freedom and the blessing only the Lord can comfort them. Only he can give us the vision and the comfort that we get from within as we love the Lord and we, we begin to say, Lord God, I realize more and more each and every day who I am. As I look at life in a different way, and I know, I know how life is. We know the things that life throws at us. The things that that try to undermine the calling of God, the things that leave us puzzled. And as I share with you, I know what life does, and life has a way of breaking our hearts. But I know that God has a way of mending and blessing and building us up that we can walk in the calling of God. Yes, we were once slaves just like they were, just like they were, but a different type of slave. We were free, but yet we were enslaved to the world. It was like being incarcerated. I can be incarcerated, God forbid, but I could be incarcerated and come to know Jesus. I'm paying my debt to society for what I've done out here, but inwardly I am free, and I can praise him and glorify him and know that one day I will walk with him in heaven. That's the difference. But when you're in bondage and don't realize you're in bondage and that you're enslaved, that is the problem. So at times of conversion, we should realize that we were once slaves as well of the things that we've done to try to get the upper hand. The things that I've done to try to get ahead and yet not realizing that I was bound, hand and foot, to serve the enemy. Bound, not being able to walk in the freedom and the virtue that God had desired. Like Joseph, an innocent man. But because of jealousy, because of pride and arrogance, 
his brothers sold him because they couldn't stomach the fact that their father loved him more and sold him. Yet he could have hated his brothers. He could have said, I want to retaliate against them when I see them. I'm going to come against all those brothers. I'm going to destroy them. Now he reaches the power to be able to do every bit of that. But what did he do? He humbled himself. His brothers couldn't recognize him any longer. To them, he was an Egyptian. There is no doubt. He was married to an Egyptian woman. His mannerism, his name, the way they cut his hair, and his authority. He couldn't be our brothers. He couldn't be my brother because look at him. But how God changed everything. How God made them come and fulfill the dream that he once had when he told them, God told me that one day you would all bow before me. Oh, oh my God, that was blasphemy at that time. How ridiculous. Even his father says, oh no. Jacob said, you're crazy. That's a bad dream, son. And yet it all came true. They all bowed before him. Master, just like the Lord said, we don't see the long-term vision that God has for each and every one of us. We don't see the end of our lives the way God does. We get to taste a little here and there as we're growing. But to see it the way the Lord sees it. Free. Free indeed. As you see the way Joseph said, you know, I could have you guys killed. I could have you hung. I could do everything I want to you, but I want to love you. That's all. I just want to love you as my brothers. He didn't want to retaliate. He didn't want to come against them. Well, they could not believe. It is impossible to think that you are our brother. And he told all the Egyptians in the room, get out. Get out. And they got out. And he told his brothers, come here. Come here. And he began to weep. Come here. And he began to weep. And he began to take his clothes off. Undo his robe. Till he undo his body. And he exposed himself to his brothers. And he exposed himself and said, look, I'm just like you. I've been circumcised. I am Joseph. And that was a seal that the brothers looked at. And then they realized of the miracle of God. We have no idea that the word, as we look at the world, that God will give us back one day. God will give us back what the canker worm and the locust has stolen from us. We may not see it right now, but there'll be a day when God will give it back to us in one way or another. He will reciprocate and he will bless us. And we would see, just like Joseph, the blessings of the Lord. Verse 23. I love this. You were bought with a price. Literally. Do not become slaves of men or of the world. We were bought with a price with the blood of Jesus. 
that God called us, shed his blood, that now we belong to the Lord God. We once belonged to the world. And the biggest struggles of life is the battle that we have with the devil because he once had us and we were his puppet. But now he knows that we're no longer a part of his authority and of his domain. But now we walk in the glory and in the power of God. Amen. And that's where trials, tribulations, and problems begin because he knows that he's lost us. We didn't know when we were captive, but now we do. That now we belong to someone else. That he bought us, paid for us, and said, you're mine. I paid for you. He bought us from the seller's block of slavery. And he says, you belong to me. Some were in prison. Some were lost. And the Lord says, you belong to me. And now we become part of the kingdom of God and become bond servants to the Lord God as our Lord has blessed us that we could walk in the newness of life for the blessings that God gives us. Glory be to the Lord God for all of his miracles and signs and wonders as we look at the word of God and begin to grow and be blessed in the calling of God if you are a slave of the Lord, praise God. And just say, thank you, Jesus. Don't look at what you're going through right now. Your life will change. Because life is filled with seasons. We have seasons that are difficult and some seasons that are a blessing. Life is filled over and over and over with different seasons. And that's why we must remain in our lane and looking ahead for the glory of God because we're going into a new adventure, a new calling, a new season as I serve the Lord with all my heart. Not realizing that what lies in the future, but all I can say is if God is for you, who can be against you? Blessed be the name of the Lord. If God is for us, who can be against us? To do the will of God is the most important thing. Service. In serving the Lord, your actions, your love of glorifying Jesus, that makes all the difference in the world. And that's why Paul shares and tells them these things so they can understand their position, their love, and their understanding. And then he says in verse 24 that I'll pick it up next week. Brothers, each man as responsible to God should remain in the situation God called them to. In other words, whatever ministry God called you and placed you. Be faithful. Be faithful to the ministry that God has called you. Be alert and know that something better one day will come. Be diligent in serving the Lord in the calling that he called you. That he's going to bless you. He's going to pole vault you. He's going to use you. You're going to shine for the glory of God. God is going to reciprocate and give you back what the world wanted to take away from you and what the devil tried to lie to you. God's going to give it to you. Stay focused on God. Stay committed to the call that he's placed on you. Be satisfied 
and be faithful and watch what the Lord will do within your life. And one day you can sing and you can dance and you can say to everybody, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He picked me up just in time. God is good. And so we thank the Lord tonight for his many blessings and all that he does for each and every one of us. I want to leave you to just saying, God bless you. May God fill your homes and your lives with joy and blessings and love like never known by you before. That he would open the windows of heaven and pour you out love like you've never seen. May the glory of the Lord fill your hearts. May God bless you, keep you, and comfort you. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in the authority and in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will receive the Lord. If you don't know him, invite him into your life. Don't be a slave for the world. Know Jesus. If you don't know him, invite him and fall in love with Jesus. Your life will never be the same. We all at Lake Hills love you. We pray for God's eternal blessing upon you. And we pray that you would continue to watch the breakdown on Friday at 7 o'clock as we're going through the book of Revelations. We'll see you there or in the air. The Lord love you. The Lord bless you. May he fill you with his grace and give you joy because the joy of the Lord, it's our strength. It's the joy of the Lord that we live for. That is the strength of our life. God bless you. From all of us at Lake Hills, we love you. See you there in the air. Tell someone about Jesus and remember to love one another. God bless. For those of you that are here, thank you.